and welcome back to my channel. Are you all ready for the freaking final deep dive into Amazon Prime's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of, oh my fucking bad, how do you fuck up Tolkien so bloody much? Right? So we start off this very last episode with Randolph. Oh, you don't know who Randolph is. Randolph is Rebate Gandalf because you all know that the stranger is Gandalf. It is all but confirmed. So yes, Randolph. Randolph is in the forest all by his lonesome, trying to get to the place where he can find his constellations. He's carrying the juicy red apple he received from Nori and he's getting the big sads looking at this apple. I was given by my friend. And then he drops his apple. The apple rolls away and he's all panicked because oh no, I want my friend's apple. And then he sees Nori pick up the apple, but dun dun dun, it's not actually Nori. It's Slim Lady Saruman. That's what I'm calling her. Will the real slim lady please stand up? And so she does kind of stand up and as she does so her glamour melts off and so she reveals herself as slim lady Saruman and her two sisters come along and so they face Randolph and they all kneel to him because he was the one they were looking for. Then we cut to a horse riding scene once again and we see Gally and her best boyfriend, Sa <laughs> sorry, Halbra riding towards Linden at breakneck speed. Halbra doesn't seem to be doing too well as he's basically passed out on his horse. How does he not fall off from said horse? No one knows, but no one is supposed to know, of course. Directly after that, you zip to Elrond and Celebrimble having a bit of a chat. Elrond has the big sads because things didn't pan out quite the way he wanted with the dwarves and he only has this wee little nugget of you know Silmaril infused mithril and Calabrimble says well we're just going to have to find a way to do more with less ah yes very clever also you know they might benefit from uh, <laughs> the advice of uh, soon oncoming Maya am I right people for those who know what a Maya is you'll get the reference then Gally rides in with Halbro by her side one he's passed out but that's just a small detail so she sees Elrond and Elrond sees her and Elrond for a hot second there actually looks he has PTSD face is what I'm gonna call it because we all know he's in an abusive friendship with Gally yes I mean that's just undeniable but still the PTSD face moment passes and then he's like oh Gally I'm so happy to see you bestie and Gally's like oh Elrond I missed you so much then right after that you do see Halbro in a sick bed being tended to by elven healer except you'll remember that in episode one or two Arondia stated that elves do not have healers they have artificers who create art and the art soothes the soul Welp, they do have medicine I mean that was my argument from the get-go but again the show can't even follow up on its own continuity and world building I just find that hilarious but so yes he's being tended to by healers and so Gally is alone with Elrond and they both or I mean mostly Elrond expresses regrets at basically having agreed with Gilgalad at shipping Gally off to Valinor and Gally Gally is also a bit regretful of everything that transpired. This is actually how Gally recounts what happened on that boat to Valinor that she jumped off of because she's a moron who thought she was Galadriel Phelps. She says she didn't feel worthy enough to go back to Valinor and I'm like uh, hashtag fake news once again because we all know you jumped off that boat because you're an idiot and because you had the big sads thinking about your bro telling you that you first have to touch the darkness before touching the light so you have to go full psychopath before being a good person apparently that's actually why you jumped but at this point is anyone surprised that she's also a pathological liar I'm pretty sure that's part of you know the diagnostic criteria for ASPD so that tracks then very next scene we see <coughs> sorry Halbro getting into Calabrimble's forge so that forge they commissioned from the dwarves I don't know what happened to it but once again you're not supposed to think when you watch the show so he's up in this forge how did he find it so easily apparently he's already healed well I mean okay fair enough I suppose elvish medicine is supposed to be very on point and very effective so I'll give them that and he cozies up to Calabrimble he's like wait you're Calabrimble the Calabrimble the famous smith 
really? Wow. I've heard so much about you and like, can we be bros and besties and Smith together? Because then he starts presenting his credentials is how I'm going to put it. And he says, you know, I heard about you through my master. And I'm like, <laughs> your master Aule, am I right? So <laughs> sorry, how bro? And then, you know, Calibre more is like, <laughs> yes, my skills are being recognized. But he also goes into the issue that he's had a lot of trouble actually working the mithril. Calibrim was supposed to be this amazing Noldor smith. Is he that grandson of Fiano? I can't remember my genealogy exactly here at the minute, but I do think that's right. He's supposed to be basically the second coming of Fiano in terms of skills and abilities, but he seems very lost at his own fucking craft he's supposed to be an expert in. Just saying, but so how bro? starts suggesting shit. He's like, have you considered that maybe adding in these different kinds of metals alloys might actually strengthen the mithril and amplify its properties? And Calibrimble, because in this fanfiction he's actually pretty thick and not that great of a smith after all, he's like, oh damn, I didn't think of that. That's brilliant, mate. Thanks. And then Calbro says, ah, you know, consider it a gift. We all know what you were trying to do there. You think you were being clever, you're still not being clever. And this is in fact insulting to lovers of the Legendarium. But okay, fine, you wanted to basically drop a little reference to fucking Anatar. Moving on. Back in freaking Numenor, yay! We see Fairy again. He is with Tarpalantia, who is really not doing well. He is on his deathbed, essentially. And he's telling a story to a bunch of architects or stonemasons, what have you, concerning, well, the fact that humans are not immortal, because that is not the fate they were allotted by the One, aka Eru Iluvata. But fine, and so, uh, humans, we can't be immortal like the elves were. Basically, actually linking back to the actual fucking source material, but you know, the show has shown us <laughs> that they don't give a single fuck about continuity, so. Eh. And so, Arian, who nobody cares about, she's a throwaway character, but fine, she's among these architects, she's a student, but apparently she's being considered for the commissioning of a big ass stone portrait of the dying king, whatever. And then Arian is alone with Tarplanty because she's sketching his head to, I don't know, be able to pitch her project to Alpharazon later on. And Tarplanty starts kind of getting very agitated. He thinks that Arian is actually his daughter Miri and portents of evil, what have you. He gets up, is even more agitated. He opens a secret doorway that leads to the room with the Palantir in it and Arian goes into that room, but I mean, we don't really see anything more than that. Moving on, no one cares. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. We're not back in Linden. We're back in a region. Whatever. <laughs> Who cares, am I right? So we're back in a region with the Elven Gang. And so we see Gali, Elrond, and Calibrimble around a big anvil with King Gilgalad, or High King Gilgalad. I'm just gonna call him Gil because that's easier. <laughs> They're trying to pitch their project for the mithril smithing, but Gil doesn't seem that convinced. I mean, he asks questions, what exactly are you gonna make out of this? A crown, a crown for the High King, also, because the crown being circular, the light of the mithril will bounce off inside the crown. They're trying to make this super scientific argument based off of optics. And I'm like, so what? Mithril works like laser therapy now? Just how is this supposed to save the elves if just one dude wears a crown with mithril in it? Is he supposed to radiate particles that will just cure the elves of their soul sickness? Just what the fuck though? Okay, whatever, but also circular structure, rings, am I right? So much clever. Gally tries to push the project and Gil is like, bitch, you ain't supposed to even be here. And I was like, ah, snap. But so no, he's having none of it. And he's like, this is not good enough. We don't have time. We have to do something else. But what would this something else be? I guess he's just ready to pack it in, mate. I don't know, whatever. That being said, Calibrimble pushes the point a wee bit further. I was going to say that Calibrimble argues that making this crown will do X, but what I meant to say is that he references Halbro's input, and that Halbro's input was but the key that unlocks the dam. Yeah, 
a bit soon, mate. Like, we all know that's literally what happened in episode six. It's the thing that made Mount Doom go boom, boom. Again, you think this is clever? It's not. It's not even cute at this point. But then worse, he goes on to say that, oh, well, the mithril will allow us to gain mastery over flesh. Wink, wink. And Gally hears this and she's like, hold up. Where have I heard this before? Mom? I mean, Gally is thick, you understand. I mean, the showrunners think the viewers are thick, but as a matter of fact, the MC is thick. So she is big thick, but now the cogs start turning in her little head. And she's like, this is very suspicious. What? She's very confused, you understand? I can't remember the exact sequence of events here, but basically she does ask Calabrimble, the Halbro tell you this, but I'm like, you heard this from a dog though, not from Halbro. So why is she associating this to Halbro? Because there is absolutely no continuity in the show and logic does not exist here but still this shit is glaring once again like this shit is glaring people okay just, uh, fine then we zip to a scene taking place in Calibrimble's Forge and Halbro is helping out bros be smithing together yeah but Gally also is kind of like loitering in the forge and she be sussing like she's just <sighs> Something's not right here. Halbro, I'm starting to have suspicions. I mean, you've been lusting after this guy for what, months? And now because of one sentence said by Color Brimble, you're like, something's not right with my boyfriend. So because of this, Gally goes to some sort of elvish archivist, historian, and now she asks for basically information on Halbro's lineage. She asks this archivist, just can you dig up whatever information on the kings of the Southlands? I'm like, bitch, now you check in? Really? Also, conversely, isn't that what made you believe Halbro was a king in the first place? You went to the archives in fucking Numenor, the hall of law people? And there you found documents that said this dude was king of the Southlands. So what, those documents didn't have a, an extensive genealogy? I seriously doubt it because that's just how stuff works in those kinds of worlds and fake histories. I'm sorry, this is such, once again, zero continuity, zero logic. She already checked, though she checked superficially and people in the Southlands just accepted the fact that Halbro was their king. But no, now she's double checking. Now, just now, after that you see Gally in this little courtyard and Halbro comes up and he's like all happy because he be smithin just talks to Gally he's all grateful and he's like thank you so much for bringing me here I'm so happy now and I'll be sure that everyone knows that you were responsible you were the MVP you're the one who brought me here you're the one who's gonna save everyone because I'm gonna help with the smithin because you believed in me so I'll make sure that you will be remembered and he puts a little head on her shoulder ah then we're back with Randolph and the cultists. So the cultists are basically trying to convince Randolph that he needs to get strong so he can remember what he needs to remember. They're trying to make him remember the fact that he's Sauron, though we all know he's not Sauron. He's in fact knockoff Gandalf. Randolph. One of the cultists also adds that he needs to find a constellation called the Hermit's Hat over in the east in Rune. So now Rune is name dropped. Okay, fine. But the thing is, Randolph is just, he's just upset. He doesn't really understand what's happening. And so basically the cultists have to magic sedate him. The thing is, the half eat a little group, is actually hiding in the bushes because they're trying to help their big friend. Basically, the half eater found out by the cultists, but they try to, you know, scamper around in the bushes to try and anti Randolph, who's in the meantime been tied up like this. Oh, but snap, it's not actually Randolph, it's Slim Lady Saruman, who's once again just cooked up a glamour of Randolph. Lenny Henry at one point also tries to intervene. He gets shanked by a flying knife, and I was like, yeah, he's dead! Now, he wasn't quite dead, but just give it a minute. But in the meanwhile, the half have been cornered against a rock by the cultists. Nori specifically is like down in the dirt. Randolph gets big upset at his little friend being in the shite. 
So he face plants once again and just sends out a shockwave of magic. And then you have this freaking fight. I swear to the bloody gods, the amount of just ripping off the Peter Jackson movies in this thing. As far as I'm concerned, this shit is plagiarism at this point. It's basically a magic duel face-off, what have you, between Slim Lady Saruman, and that's why I'm calling her that, by the way, and Randolph, down to the fucking color scheme too, because Slim Lady Saruman is all in white, Randolph is basically clothed in grayish rags. Y'all remember? That fight in Orthanc between Saruman and Gandalf, even down to the Saruman just basically levitating Gandalf and turning him around every which way, this is exactly what fucking happens in the scene. Like, literally. Slim Lady Saruman has her staff and she's like moving Randolph about in the air. It's straight up copy pasting what happens in the Peter Jackson movie and thus... Is that scene specifically in the books? I cannot remember, but can't the fuck on, which is why we all bloody know that Randolph is Gandalf, okay? Just fucking stop with the mystery box bullshit because we all know that's who he is. Anyway, Randolph gets knocked out, Slim Lady Saruman just summons shit ton amount of fire, it's chaos, oh no, will the happy die, Meh. Then Nori picks up Slim Lady Saruman's staff, which we drop for whatever reason. She gives it to Randolph and she's like, here, use this to do magic. How does she know this is gonna work? Just don't ask. So Randolph does in fact use the staff just as Slim Lady Saruman is about to roast the half eat. Really wish she had though. <laughs> but so Randolph comes up to her and the other two cultists. He screams, he says magic words, whatever. And them cultists are basically revealed to be what? Fucking Nazgul? The staff reveals their true natures and they look like ring wraiths in the Beach of Jackson movies. The way Frodo sees them when he puts the ring on. I was like, what the fuck though? So they're ring wraiths before the fucking rings were fought? Just what? And then just pushes the staff at them and then they dissolve in clouds of moths. Fine, and I mean the moths as well. Just like Gandalf was printed a little moth on top of Orthanc. We fucking get it, he's Gandalf, just fucking move on. Though at least we did have this one little consolation prize. Lenny Henry slash Sadok actually croaks. I don't know how he survived for that many minutes having been shanked, because he's shanked again, I think. And you're like, nah, I know I'm gonna die. They literally have a wizard right fucking there. No, just not gonna help. Okay, so he's just gonna sit there with his homies and just die as he watches the sun come up. But I mean, at least a half foot croaked. Yay! Back with the Numenorean navy, all one ship of them. What happened to the other two that just all their crew die? What? Okay, I mean, there's just one Numenorean ship left coming home to Numenor from Middle Earth. Elendil and Miri have a bit of a chat in the cargo hold of the ship. Elendil has the big bitters because he helped Gali and helping Gali basically in his mind led to his son dying, though we once again all know that Isildur is not actually dead, but he doesn't know that. So he's like, you know that my name it also means elf friend. She already knew that mate, she actually pointed this out to you in episode three, but whatever. But so he repeats this, and so he's just big sad and big bitter about the fact that he followed the imperative contained within his name, that he helped out a friend, because elf friend, yay? But then Miri tries to be just very stoic and calm, and she tells him, well, you know, the way of the faithful is to accept to pay potentially a very steep price for keeping faith in the fact that it will somehow all turn out for the best. I was like, is this once again magic commentary for viewers of the show? Accept to pay a price, a steep price, watching this garbage, but keep faith that it will pay off at some point. Yeah, no bitches, I'm not falling for that shit. I'm not continuing with the show after this, but nice try, I'll give you that. Just a little meta commentary there. And then everyone goes up on deck because they're getting back to Numenor, but Miri senses somehow that something's off. And so she asks Elendil, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? And so you see in the harbor of Armenelos that, First off, shit ton of ships. Did, did anyone else observe this? 
the armada that didn't exist when they had to leave for middle earth now all of a sudden there's a crap ton of ships just saying but all the ships are sporting black sails black sails of mourning because alas king tarpalantia has passed away so big sayed for miri she lost her dad but <laughs> big i'm happy from fairy because now it's his time to shine because he's gonna you know grab at that delicious juicy power not that we're gonna see any of this right now but for y'all that want to carry on with the show that's presumably what you will see at some point in the future then we're back in a region in Celebrimble's forge. There's a big boom, explosion, but everyone's fine in the forge. Okay, cool, cool for them. <laughs> but so Celebrimble says, oh, the Mithril, it's proud. I guess it's because it's got that uppity Silmaril essence in it, right? So the Mithril's proud. They don't really know how to work it, but Sa <coughs> sorry, Halbro, for a little while longer here, he says, well, we need to coax the metals to blend and work together. Who gives a fuck? But basically, yes, he's giving smithing advice to the non Expert Smith, that is Calibrimble. Then we zip to Galley, who's in a very pretty garden with a scroll she just received from the Elvish archivist she consulted with. And well, this scroll is basically a genealogical record of, well, uh, the Southland monarchs. And well, apparently the very last monarch of the Southlands died a thousand years ago. So Galley's like, meh? She big confused. Once again, like you're just checking this out now also this directly contradicts presumably what you set up in episode three but what is continuity am i right who gives a fuck about that silly thing but so she big confused and getting big mad as we all know she can and guess who shows up her boyfriend and he's like darling what's wrong and galley basically face says we need to have the talk and i think that's sad they're gonna break up and they didn't even have sex just <sighs> kids these days, am I right? So they have the talk. Gally's getting very agitated whilst Halbro is just like, well, what's wrong? And Gally's like, document, what's this bitch? Like, excuse me, you told me you were king of the Southlands. And he's like, no, I didn't. You assumed I was king of the Southlands. I told you I wasn't. I told you I got my little amulet thingy off a dead man's corpse, which is entirely true, by the way. She's like, but you wanted to be back on your throne in the Southlands. He's like, nah, I was chilling in Numenor. You insisted that I come back with you to Middle Earth, which is once again, 1000% true. And at one point she's like, what's your name? Tell me your name. You're my boyfriend. What's your actual name? And Halbro's like, I have many names. And if you recall, in the intro to the entire show, Gally was actually narrating the fact that Sauron had many names. True. Myron, Sauron, Anatar. So, um, yes, Halbro's like, <laughs> Gally is having none of it and she loses her cool because Gally. And so she's basically like, bitch, tell me your fucking name. And then boom, we get into a dream mind fuckery, mind manipulation sequence. We see Gally dropped basically in the very first scene of the show. She's back in her childhood home of Valinor, right outside of Tyrion, I'm assuming. And her bro shows up. Finrod! Hello, Finrod! And at first she's like, no, you're not real, it's just Sauron, my now ex-boyfriend, messing with my head. But then she looks at Finrod and it's like, oh, my brother, I loved you so much. And Finrod's like, yes, I'm here, it's all right. And so they sit down together under that tree, just like in that opening scene for the entire season, or the entire show as well, Sauron, but through Finrod, the Finrod illusion, tries to convince Gally that it's all Good, calm down, just accept me, accept the plan. Actually, Sauron, he's a good guy. He's a good man, or I mean, Maya in this case, but whatever. He wants, you know, to make a nice world for everyone. I mean, you don't want to rule it, of course, but still, chill and nice for everyone. Just cake and ambrosia for everyone on tap. <laughs> but she was like, but no, but the darkness and the light. And Finrod's like, how about you touch the darkness again? <laughs> Yeah, we know which darkness she wants to touch, am I right? I think because it's not the exact same phrase Finrod actually told her, she once again kind of breaks out of the illusion. So she's like, yeah. So then Gally finds herself on the raft where she first met her boyfriend. Well, I mean, now it's her ex-boyfriend, sadly. Well, I mean, in the process of becoming her ex-boyfriend. And here Halbro, <coughs> well, 
oh sorry Sauron so Sauron is on the raft with her and he tries to talk to her directly and once again he tries to explain that he's a good guy but she's like no you evil and you worked with Morgoth and you bayard but he's like no you know what fuck Morgoth I didn't actually like him now I'm just saying that Morgoth would be very sad and upset at hearing that his erstwhile boy toy is dissing on him that is an ang bang reference for those who can appreciate it Kelly is not really believing any of this, of course, because she's just arguing that no, you evil, you kid my brother, me, me, me. And I mean, to be fair, Sauron is right about everything, though, because he tells her, yeah, I told you I'd done evil. You didn't care. And in point of fact, Gali did not care. Because once again, audience say it with me. Hashtag Gali is a genocidal and sadistic psycho. So she didn't care that he was evil or that he had a shady past. She was just like gung-ho about putting him on that Southland throne and lusting up his dick. And he also makes an appeal to the one. So Eru Iluvatar, the force of good and light. And so he says that I am aligning with that. I want to bring goodness back into the world and undo the evil that was well, basically perpetrated by Morgoth, his erstwhile sugar daddy. But no, Gali is just, no, no, I don't want to listen to any of this. But still, Sauron is like, you and me, baby, power couple. Not even power couple of evil, though, because he shows her an image of them reflected in the water, where he kind of looks like standard Sauron, and her so like being king and queen. Basically, Sauron proposes marriage to her. That's what it is. He's like, you could be my queen, queen of Middle Earth, and I'd be your king. And he also says, you know, you could bring me and bind me to the light, and I could give you and bind you to power. But she's still like, yeah, but you want to rule. He's like, what's the difference though? Yeah, I'll be a ruler, a tyrant, but a good one. A nice tyrant. Isn't that cool? And you can be a fellow tyrant by my side, because I love you. She rejects him, and then he gets, as I predicted. Oh, by the way, can we all recognize that I fucking called this? So, uh, <laughs> Sauron, he big mail. He big upset. My woman is rejecting me. What the actual fuck? I will not stand for this nonsense. And then he basically tries to shame her. Like, you know, bitch, you say any of this to your elf friends, they'll blame you. Because, like, you brought me back to Middle Earth. This is all basically your fault. Once again, he's 1000% right. It is, in fact, entirely her fault. But I'll get back to that. And the elves, without us doing what we need to do, basically forging the rings, because that's basically what he's implying or outright referencing. I can't remember exactly. Exactly, whatever, the elves will be doomed and pass into nothingness. It's like, Nyeh! she's dream yeeted into the water and she starts drowning. So then Gali is basically grabbed out of the water, so out of a dream sequence by Elrond, but uh, you know, given she was in a dream sequence with illusions and shit, she's like, prove to me that you are who you say you are. So she asks him a question, he passes the test, and he's like, Gali, what the fuck? Just what the fuck happened? Why were you in the river? She's like, no, no, it's just chaos panic defcon one we have to hurry and ah! so she just runs back to the forge and once she gets back to the forge she well realizes that her boyfriend sorry her ex is gone he's left so then calabrimble elrond and galley are together they have to decide what to do with the actual mithril and galley doesn't tell anyone about Sauron. I guess he just psyched her out about the whole they'll blame you if you tell them that you know you were lusting after me the big bad guy but still like if she's really supposed to be the fucking heroine here why isn't she telling anyone? And so the trio basically decide that instead of making one crown we're gonna make three rings or rather Gally suggests this so Gally once again may I ask you know for a fact that this was your ex's plan though he wants those rings to be forged but you're going along with it because reasons all oh, right because you're abjectly thick never mind so she says one crown or ring would pose too great of a risk of corruption two would divide but three offers stability so let's make three rings bitches but calabrimble's like most of the metals we tried with mithril like the mithril doesn't like those metals so instead we need the finer metals as in gold and silver but we need particularly pure gold and silver the gold and silver in your bros shiv that you know got out of valinor and so galley's like my bro shiv but that's what i have left of him no but he 
is massive now. How am I going to remember my brother, though? Ah, uh, well, got to sacrifice for the cause, bitch. Then we're back with the half eat and Randall. Or, I mean, Randolph has gone back to the half eat. Randolph has basically gained his memories back, or I mean, most of them. He's very eloquent now, but he still wants to go to Rune to regain all of his memories. However, he did learn from the cultists that he is an Astar. Yes, an Astar, the Astari being the wizard of the legendarium. He tells Nori that in your tongue, the tongue of the half eat, Istar means wizard. And I'm like, no, it's not a fucking hobbit word. What? It's a Quenya word. Ugh, to the end. And then you have the longest fucking farewell scene I've ever seen in my goddamn life. <gasps> It takes them 30 minutes to fucking leave. Well, I mean, at first they're like, okay, Randolph's gonna go east, but then Nori is basically encouraged by the tribe to go with Randolph because she's knock off Frodo. So she's saying farewell to everyone. Oh, just didn't care. They also repeat that at one point. Nobody goes off trail and nobody walks alone. Just fuck off. You're all psycho. We don't care. And Poppy is very upset that her best friend is leaving because she's basically lost her entire family. So she has the big sad at losing her best friend. Okay, understandable enough. Nori starts leaving and she's sad because she wanted a last hug from her best friend. I was almost certain they were gonna once again plagiarize the PJ movies and have Poppy basically join Nori at the last minute, just like Samwise just joins Frodo at the last minute. But no, not quite. She does run after Nori, but they just hug basically. So Nori climbs up a hill with Randolph before, you know, properly leaving the territory where the half-feet reside. Uh, uh, Randolph, at one point, says, because Nori's like, I don't really know where we're going. I don't know if I should lead, because I don't know what I'm doing here, bitch. And Randolph says, when in doubt, young Nori Brandyfoot, follow your nose. <laughs> They think it's a big cliffhanger. Oh my god, we still don't really know who this wizard is. It's fucking Gandalf! It's so bloody obvious, though. They think this shit is subtle. It's really not. It's fucking Gandalf, or in this instance, Rebate Gandalf, aka Randalf. And so they exit, and we are now rid of the fucking heartbeat. Good riddance. And then fucking finally, in the show title Rings of Power, we see how some of the Rings of Power are forged. Next to nothing happened for seven episodes, or what did happen was full of egregious stupid, but then this momentous moment of, you know, the fucking rings being forged basically passes in all of, what, five, ten minutes? Not even that. Talk about anticlimactic and underwhelming. Wow. But so, yes, Gali sacrifices her bro's ship. She puts it in the... It's not an oven, but you know what it is to melt the metal. They take the metal out. They pour it in this very elaborate uh, mold thing. I mean, there's a mold. I think they wanted to make it look fancy. Okay, fair enough. Whatever. So they have these little bars of metal. Two of them look golden, bronzish. One looks silver. I don't really think that's how that works, but okay. And then there's this elaborate montage of selecting the jewels and then all the various jewel smiths participating in this project, apparently. Just bending the metal, making rings out of them, setting the jewels, Blah, 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 blah. And finally, you see the three rings. Ooh, shiny. Though in the meantime, Elrond actually found Galley Scroll in the river. So now he knows that Halber is in fact Sauron. But he comes back to the forge, basically as the rings are being finished. And he says nothing. Though he does exchange a look with Galley. And I'm like, yeah, you both know that the other one knows, but nothing is said. Once again, why would Elrond not say anything though? That's what I don't get. Her, she's scared of having her ass whooped because she done fucked up. But him, okay, I guess maybe he'll say something in the ensuing seasons. Not that I care, but okay, fine. So shiny rings. Never mind the fact that actually the men's and the doors rings should be forged first. Sauron and Anatar should in fact be involved because you know the whole binding of the fucking rings of power to the one ring just... No? Oh right, yeah. Like, lore. Who gives a fuck about lore, am I right? Like, that's stupid. Continuity? Oh yeah, that's also stupid. Just... <clears throat> my bad. My bad, I forgot. And finally, closing shot of this absolute train wreck of a show. You see Mordor, just panoramic shot of Mordor, and apparently it has phased out of its uh, Blade Runner apocalyptic orange. Good for it, I guess. 
it actually now looks like the model everyone's familiar with, or I mean, those who are familiar with the story. And we see Saron walking up on uh, well, a mountain pass, looking into Mordor, and he's like, I'm back home, bitches! One does not simply walk into Mordor, unless you are Sauron, apparently, so... <laughs> what well, makes sense. It's his home, after all. But so yes, he's coming home, though. He lost his girlfriend. Isn't that sad, though? And it ends? But! No, it couldn't just end. They had to just... Mm, that knife in the wound. Oh yes, you get a song. No offense to the singer, but what the fuck was that song? It was cringe as fuck, because basically what is being sung is this poem about the rings of power. You know, three rings for the elven kings, under the sky, the nine rings for the dwarves, uh, no, is that for the humans? I can't remember exactly, and you know, the whole one ring to rule them all, blah blah. It's just fucking funny at this point, because You've done fucked up the continuity of the actual fucking forging of the Rings of Power. Again, because they think we viewers are abjectly thick, or they're just relying on the majority of their viewers being completely ignorant of the source material, I guess, or the PJ movies, maybe. But that song was insulting. No, it doesn't live up to the fucking Enya song at the end of Fellowship, that magnificent haunting Emiliana Torini song at the end of Two Towers, or that fucking Annie Lennox song at the end of Return of the King. Just Fuck off. <laughs> I'm gonna do the little, uh, party parrot dance that I survived and I'm done with this shit. It is a travesty. It is egregious. Just the amount of, well, first the law butchering. So this is not an adaptation in any way, shape or form. This is shitty fan fiction, but it's, it's shitty fan fiction. Like it's not even good on its own merits. The writing is atrocious. The plotting nonsensical. There is so much egregious stupid in this thing. No continuity whatsoever. Breaking of their own world building. Also, I talked about these mystery boxes. First off, if you didn't know, a shit ton of details for season one were actually leaked a couple months before the show aired. So I knew for a while that Halbro was Sauron. I mean, I wasn't sure at the beginning, but basically as all the leaks came true, I was like, oh, okay, well, we all know that Halbro is Sauron. But I mean, even beyond the leaks, it's very fucking obvious in some places. This shit is not engaging. Again, we're not all thick. It's very fucking obvious. And then the way they revealed it was just, oh, come on. And then the same thing with fucking Randolph. They actually think that because they're not actually naming him in season one that it's some sort of cliffhanger, that we're all excited for the reveal of the second mystery box. We all fucking know it's Gandalf, okay? And then also, may I add, the whole Sauron turns evil because of his girlfriend thing, because that's actually what happens if you think about it. All of this shit is Gally's fault. Gally could have left Sauron in Numenor. She encouraged him to go back to Middle-earth. She was the one who wanted to push him into power and violence. Basically, in a way, she's the one who turns him evil because the fact is Sauron was kind of ready to be good. He still wanted power, still wanted to rule, but he said, you will bind me to light. And he seems sincere enough about it, to be honest. And it kind of tracks with what Adar had said previously, that he wasn't all bad, actually. It does mildly track with the source material insofar as apparently he was tempted to repent in a way, but they pushed this further here. And he could have been coaxed into being maybe not good with a capital G, but a decent tyrant, kind of, alongside Gally. And Gally would have been, well, I mean, not in this iteration, but theoretically she would have been a good influence on him. So basically, Sauron becomes evil because a woman spurned him. And so I won't give my final rating quite yet, because I am going to do a season one review. I mean, you all kind of know what I think about this already, but I will state this here. Yes, this is Game of Thrones season eight tier. Absolutely no question about it. This is pathetically bad. This is the proof, the ultimate proof, that money ill-spent cannot create art cannot generate talent. So this is just as bad as Game of Thrones season eight. It's like, it's that level of bad. So my erstwhile trifecta of trash, which was composed of the Annihilation movie, the Aragon movie, and the later ending seasons of the Game of Thrones TV show, has now become a foursome of foulness because Rings of Power joins their ranks. Yay for me, I guess.
So that wraps up all of my deep dives for Rings of Power, Amazon Prime's shitty fanfiction of legendarium material. It was an ordeal, but I made it through for you all. And to be fair, some high quality memes have come out of this train wreck, so there is that. I'm now free! Because y'all can be certain I'm so not watching season two of this shit. I'm also not going to watch season two of Wheel of Time for that matter. I am not going to continue enabling these Muppets. Oh, hell no. But so I'm done. Once again, party parrot dance. Yay. <laughs> if you want to share your thoughts, opinions, what have you done in the comments, you're more than welcome to do so. Or why not on the Discord server? There is a permanent link for it in the description box down below as well. In the meantime, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whatever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support. Also, I have a new tattoo. <laughs> I shall see you all reasonably soon, yes, in another video. But until then, bye-bye.